Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Learner and Families Committee. I think we'll be OK. Um, so welcome, a special welcome to uh, Miranda, who's our primary school teachers rep, and Tim, who's our secondary school teachers rep. It's good to have you along. And without further ado, I'll pass on to Danny, our clerk, for declarations of interest. Uh, um, do any members have any declarations of interest? To, to class? Uh, thank you, Danny. And next we'll do the minutes. Um, are we happy to agree the minute of meeting of Learning and Families Committee 3rd of May? Thank you. And uh, the minute of meeting of the Executive Subcommittee of Learning and Families Committee of 20th of March? Thank you. And the minute of a uh, meeting of children, young people, and families partnership of third March, which I think you were at early. So, thank you. Um, we will pass on to. We'll now do the. Yeah, thank you. So the clerk will uh, do subs and stuff like that as well. Thanks. Um. Yep. Yeah, again. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um. I've got substitutes. Um. Let's just say uh, we've got Provost McDade is substituting for Councillor Colin Stewart. Um, Councillor Illenworth is, uh, is sorry, substituting for Councillor Reid. And we've got Councillor Allen who is substituting for Councillor Kigali. Um, I think that's just looking at uh, who's here and who's in attendance online. I think that's all. But if anyone's got any other substitutions or apologies, please just uh, let me know. Thank you, Danny. Um, item number four is the outstanding business statement. Has anybody any comment on or questions on the outstanding business statement or can we agree it? I think we'll take that as an agreed. Uh, thank you. And Danny, can you give us a verbal update to committee appointments, please? Although I think I've touched on that already. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. Um, just a very brief update for myself, uh, members just in relation to um appointments to the committee for non-elected members um as the convener has already said um uh, we've got tim and miranda here today uh, from the teacher side um they were both um appointed at the last committee and this is our first committee as members um just an update since last committee um as was agreed um at our committee in may um the process for the appointment of the third religious representative. Um, so in light of that, Adrian Ferguson was the sole applicant for the position of third religious representative on the committee. So with this in mind and Adrian having served in this role since 2019 and following a uh, prior discussion with the convener, it is recommended that Adrian be reappointed to this committee. Uh, Thanks, Danny. Um, are we content with what Clark's just asked us to do? Thank you. Uh, be before we do, uh, sorry, Danny. Yes, thanks, Convener. Uh, and I've just got a further update just for committee um, with regards to the um, parent council representatives. This is actually in the outstanding business statement as well, but just um, to make you all aware here today, um, this is going to be a continued uh, process. We did go out to our, we did go out for advertisement on that. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get um, nominations as we as we hoped. So and that's with specific regard to the primary sector. So therefore, um, and keeping in mind the reconvening of parent councils uh, with the new school year, uh, this is a process which will continue. And I'll bring an update to the next committee if I'm satisfied with that. Thanks again, Danny. Before we move on to our first paper of substance, which is paper six, I'm going to ask our executive director, Sheena Devlin, to give us a brief um, update with committee's permission on the recent SQA results. That's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener. I thought it would be helpful to share with committee just the high level information in relation to what we call our ASL data, our curriculum for excellence data, as well as our SQA results for this session, bearing in mind that there will be the very detailed report will come to this committee in October. And before that point in October, we will also provide a briefing note that will have this information contained in it. 
I would want to acknowledge, first of all, that in continuing challenging circumstances, our children, our young people, families and all school staff have worked hard in session 22-23 to continue to deliver a positive and in many instances an improving picture of attainment. And as I've said, we will report in more detail in, about that in the Raising Attainment Report, which comes to this committee in October. In our broad general education, where we um, consider the curriculum for excellence levels at primary one, four, seven and S3, I'm pleased to provide the following information. Achievement of a level data was maintained or improved in both literacy and numeracy at all levels. There was a 1% increase in the whole school average in writing across primaries one, four and seven with a notable increase at primary four, a 4% 4 increase following targeted work which we have undertaken across various schools, which will continue then to be rolled out more widely given the efficacy it has demonstrated over a, re a relatively short period of time. You know that we consider ACORN data when we look at our areas of deprivation and poverty and the overall ACORN poverty related gap was actually reduced from 20% to 17% across all areas of literacy and numeracy. The percentage gap between the SIMD quintiles 1 and quintiles 5 remains at 20%. The percentage of looked after children in primary 1, 4 and 7 achieving expected levels in literacy and numeracy combined has increased by 14% over the last year. Moving on, convener to S3 results. In S3, our level three attainment was maintained at 90%, which represents a 1% drop on the historic high that we saw in 2022. And in terms of ACORN, our poverty related gap reduced from 12% to 9% in terms of that level three attainment. And over this same period, our level four attainment improved from 52% to 64 on our 21-22 performance. In terms of now moving on to SQA, it's important to remember that the assessment landscape over time was different in different years. So in 2020, qualifications were delivered purely as a result of teacher professional judgment over a shortened school year. In 2021, we followed what was known as the alternative certification model allowing young people more opportunity to evidence their learning in ways other than the one-off examination. And in 2022, there were mitigations and alterations to the assessment examination landscape. And in 23, these alterations remained, but rather than generously, these scripts would now be marked as described as sensitively. And those are phrases used by SQA. Each session since 2020, where the pass rate nationally was at a record high, this has resulted in a year on year decline in national pass rates. In 2023, pass rates had fallen nationally by up to 2%. In Perth and Kinross, our senior phase attainment has, however, remained robust in these varying circumstances. National five pass rate is sitting at 80.9% compared to the national average of 78.8%. Our higher pass rate, slightly less than the national rate, it was 76.6 compared to 77.1. And our advanced higher pass rate of 77.2% is lower than the national rate of 79. But um, importantly, at that stage, the poverty related attainment gap in Perth and Kinross is lower than the national rate. I appreciate there's a lot of information there, but what I really wanted just to outline is a, a range of pretty positive information for you that we will put in a briefing note for all members of this committee, and we will provide the more detailed um, information and analysis in comparison with other years when the Raising Attainment Report comes in October. Convener, thank you. Thanks very much. I think that's really helpful. Thank you. Although that's a verbal report, I think I think if there are one or two brief questions on a on that high level verbal update, I think that would be appropriate. If the, if there are any, um, feel free to to ask now. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, convener. Um, just your your last point about the poverty related attainment um, 
having it being better than the national average. Um, am I right in thinking that it is not as good as last year in PQC or nationally? In terms of at national five, our poverty related attainment gap for this measure is 12.8 compared to 15.6 nationally. For higher, ours is um, 6.8 compared to the national figure of 16%. And for advanced higher, the gap is um, sitting at 8.2%, Councillor Barrett, which is lower than the national rate of 11.5. What I don't have in front of me is where our figures sit in comparison to where they were last year. But that will be, we can provide that information and include that in a briefing note. But that will certainly be the level of detail that will feature in our October report. Thank you. And I think if I can just add a very brief politician's answer to that, if I may, Councillor Barrett, I found that really interesting that the poverty related attainment gap reduced during COVID when we were measuring students differently. Um, and I think that kind of backs up a lot of what Louise Hayward has suggested in her review, and I welcome that personally. But thanks for the question. Grant, thank you. We'll move on to um, Paper 6, Education Children's Services Annual Performance Report, and I'll come back to Sheena to introduce that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. This report presents the Education and Children's Services Annual Performance Report for 22-23. It provides, we believe, a broad and balanced view of service performance over the past year against performance targets and updates on priority actions identified in the Education and Children's Services Business Management and Improvement Plan last year. The report highlights areas of success, as well as those areas where progress has been limited or where targets have not been met, and those remain a focus for our work across the service. Improving outcomes for children, young people and families and for the people in the justice system remains the core business of ECS. I'm privileged to work alongside colleagues who demonstrate commitment, creativity, perseverance and resilience in delivering these services, and I extend my sincere thanks to each and every member of our teams for this. Convener, I would just want to make committee aware that we are in fact four members of staff down who would ordinarily be attending committee to answer some of the more detailed questions perhaps that some members might have in relation to this and other papers today but those of us who are here in person and are here online will do our best to answer any questions that members have anything that we can't answer today we'll seek to provide the information at a later date thank you uh, thanks again Sheena any questions uh, Chris uh, Bailey O'Hearn. Bailey O'Hearn. I'll get that right one of these days. Chris. He will. It's only been six and a half, seven and a half years. Six years. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, your first question is on um, paragraph 5.3 on page 20, and it's with regards to the rollout of the performance management software. Uh, what stage are we at of the rollout? Um, Greg Boland may be able to give you an answer, but if, if not, we uh, can uh, provide it. No worries, thank you. Greg, are you able to answer that? Is it unfair of you to ask? Can we provide a small update? Um, We've had, um, we've had staff unfortunately leave, so the, the, the rollout has been slowed down. Uh, the system's obviously in place and early works um, um, is, is, is under been undertaken, but the actual full rollout is still to take place. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to provide the committee with an update exactly on the, on the timelines for that uh, uh, after this. Thanks, Greg. Is that, is that OK, Billy? And thank you. Much appreciated. Um, Councillor McPherson, please. Oh, thank you, convener. Um, it was just a, a point of clarification, really. On um, page 30, under the heading of update on priority actions 2022-23, um, the statement says an order of the implementation of Circle in May 2022 confirmed that most schools were implementing at the universal level in line with expectations. I see the, the following sentence does say all schools, but I was just uh, seeking to clarify, are there any schools that haven't currently implemented the Circle approach? Thank you. 
Professor McPherson, all schools have at least begun implementation. There are some schools who have not yet completed that and they will continue to do that throughout the course of this year. That's a relatively small number of the total number of schools who are in that position and they're in that position for a range of um, justifiable and different reasons relating to other priorities or staffing difficulties within the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Councillor Allen, please, for question number one. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm also a member of the scrutiny committee and asked many questions at the scrutiny committee at that time. I enjoyed the paper, it's a good paper. However, it would be remiss of me not to ask one or two more questions that I missed at that time. Um, on page 20 at 5.5, .5, it talks about the stubbornness of the gap um, in high deprivation areas. Can you help us understand what the key focus of activity entails? As it says in the tin there, it's stubborn. What are we doing and are we having any success in moving it? Thank you. I think, Councillor Allen, in terms of the brief update I was able to provide in relation to the SQA data and the um, curriculum for excellence levels, you'll see that we are actually making a bit of a difference there across all areas. I'm minded of a publication that came out in the year 2010, and it was a, a document called Joining the Dots by Professor Susan Deacon, who at that point referred to stubborn inequalities which remain difficult to change. And, and within that, she was referring across wider society. And of course, where we understand that there are you know, inequalities that are stubbornly difficult to change, that will of course manifest itself in all parts of society, including in schools. But what we do see is a very targeted approach. And one of the papers that will be coming again in October will be the paper around the pupil equity fund spend. And um, you would then be able to see there exactly some of the very targeted approaches that are being taken and that are making a difference. So it varies depending on need, complexity of need, scale of issue. It will vary, vary determined by the, the context of schools, but that very focused and targeted work is beginning to chip away at what I would describe as a wicked issue. And a wicked issue is something that there is no silver bullet to solve. It is a difficult situation that can only be made incrementally better piece by piece. And that's really the approach we're taking with this. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, Councillor Shires, please. Thank you, convener. Um, it's a really good report. And there's loads and it's a really uh, interesting read. Um, one of my questions was on page four of the report and it talks about further implementation of language and communication support from speech and language therapists. I was just on a, a sort of general um, issue is, are there plenty of qualified speech and language therapists out there? Um, is that an area that we're working with? Um, presumably NHS Tayside or, or the Scottish Government to make sure that that's an area that we can recruit because I'm imagining post pandemic it is an area that um, particularly in nurseries and, and early stages in primary schools that the demand is quite high. Uh, thank you Councillor Sayers, I think that's a very pertinent question. Sheila. Councillor Sayers, you're absolutely right and what we do have is data that shows that, that you know the impact of the pandemic particularly on those who are disadvantaged beforehand has been significantly more than those who were not. And we certainly see that manifesting itself in terms of literacy development and acquisition in young people. We have a um, service level agreement with NHS Tayside for speech and language um, therapy provision, and there have been significant changes to how that has been taken forward and Fiona Mackay would be able to provide more information about the, the specifics of that. But we have worked, continued to work in partnership with NHS Tayside to make sure that the resource that is available is used to support the biggest number of children and young people at any one time, which might sometimes mean group sessions rather than individual sessions. But just very recently, um, there has been work underway nationally to look at some additional resource coming in to each of the regional improvement collaborative areas, and that is additional support for language um, therapy support and with a particular target uh, focus rather at the early years. So uh, 
you asked a very specific question about a sufficiency. I'm not in a position to answer whether there is in fact a sufficiency, but I, I do have the view that the, the changes that have been made to how the available resources being used is to try and benefit as many young people as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. I think if, if I'm reading the body language correctly, you're trying to add something, Hazel, or have I picked that one? No, not to that particular question. I suppose the, the only other reference in the report to speech and language is around the training for social work staff in talking mats, which is very much around the advocacy of, of children, but speech and language has been vital in delivering that. Great. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, if I can ask uh, Bailey Ahern, I've got that right this time, for his second question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, second question is on page 31 and it's to do with the supportive framework moving from uh, school to, to work and the 16 plus framework that was ready for implementation in June 23. Uh, the question is, has that been implemented for the current academic year? And if so, what has changed from before and how will that be monitored throughout the year to make sure it's on track? Thank you, Billy. And David, are you able to answer that, please? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is that is ready for implementation in the current session and is currently being implemented. Um, and, and the real thing about what's changed is um, a, a greater emphasis on partnership working in terms of those young people who have got the greatest barriers to move into the post school environment to make sure that they have the right options. And actually that, that word options plural is really important in moving ahead. So it's about that partnership approach, but it's also about the, the, the greater devolution of resource to do that. So there's more regular um, communication, more structured communication and a greater framework of quality assurance round about that to make sure that it's going to have the, best, the, the biggest impact, if you like, for those that need it the most. Thanks, David. Uh, Councillor Allen, second question, please. Thank you, Convener. On page 30, we talk about overall leavers attainment and the lowest attaining 20% of our school leavers remains the area requiring the greatest attention. Uh, I understand how difficult that is. I'm just wondering if there's any examples that can be shared of work that's being done in that area to support that group or given that, that they are leavers are they just lost to us? Thank you. I'm reasonably confident they're not just lost us, but David, if you want to add to that again, please. Absolutely. So we've been doing a lot of work. We'll continue to do a lot of work to reshape our senior phase curriculum so that it's most responsive to the needs to all those young people that come to our schools. And um, so an example of that would be the way that we've tried to improve the number of level five type courses that we offer in the secondary landscape. Um, and we're doing that through the introduction of a large number of what we're calling um, National Progression Awards. And these offer level five qualifications for young people who may not be in a position to sit a, a National Five examination. So over the last three years, we've moved from really no NPAs offered within PKC to a place where we currently have 22 different National Progression Awards and of course our key partnership with our colleagues at uh, University Highlands of Islands in Perth. So our curriculum and some of the work we're doing around about learning and teaching is absolutely focused upon that group and ensuring that we actually exceed a virtual comparator for that measure in times as we move ahead. Thanks David. Councillor Massey. Uh, thank you convener. Uh, my question is on page 13 of the uh, report and page 37 of our pack. Uh, it talks about the step starter uh, sacks. Is there someone that could expand on that and tell me what these are and how they've been used? Um, Annie, are you able to give us an answer to that, please? Yep, sorry about that. Yeah, the step starter parts are all to do with the communication and language and given a lot of different jobs and things for the children to do in the nursery. But Rhoda, who works for the children and families team, can probably give more information. She's been sharing these out. Thanks, Annie. Uh, Rhoda. Thank you. So these were packs um, that was given out as part of a Scottish Government initiative, and these were to gypsy traveller families. Um, so we have given out 20 starter sacks so far. 
and this was done through the early years family and practitioners within the ELC settings. So the first pack was around um, sort of stories, so again it very much took in the, the culture of the Gypsy Traveller families. We've just started to give out the second pack where these are more sort of science based activities and stories for the families. So the feedback for these uh, packs so far has been really positive and what it has done it's actually enabled us to build the relationships with those families and encourage them into nursery provision and also attend other sort of family learning activities and support that we offer. Thanks Rona. Uh, Councillor Shires please. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question's on page six of the report, um, and it's regarding the concept of validated self-evaluation, which only education could come up with an expression like that. Um, and it was just to get an understanding about how that fits with, I mean, it sounds to me, it might not be, but it sounds to me like a lot of work for schools that sits in around the the, the work that they have to do anyway. Um, and I wondered how that all fits with the inspection um, regimes. Um, and what was my other part of my question? Um, yeah, um, it refers to common themes that are developed, that are found across the secondary schools. And just to get an understanding of what work then, you know, once those themes are identified, what work then takes place um, to, to help improve the, the schools. Thanks, Caroline. Sharon, please. Thank you. So validated self-evaluation um, is really what it says on the tin, Councillor Shires. It is really looking at the self-evaluation that all schools are expected to do in relation to their performance based on the quality indicators from how good is our school. And we don't undertake validated self-evaluations on an annual basis or on a routine basis, but rather where we feel that there are common themes across all areas of schools that we would want to have a closer look at. And um, members who will be reminded perhaps of the collaborative improvement activity that we undertook in 2020-2021 to look at our inclusive practice within our secondary schools. And as part of that work, we agreed with our secondary uh, school colleagues and our school leaders in secondary schools that we would undertake a validated self-evaluation of inclusive practice across all of those schools um, for two purposes. One was to actually validate and support the self-evaluations that schools themselves were doing in that area. Um, and the result of that um, two day visit was that for a school perspective, they received some recommendations for um, improvement and some validation of their own self evaluation of where they were um, showing some strengths. But the second part of that was that as a local authority, we were able to look across all of our secondary schools and pull out some common themes and areas for development, not just for schools, but for the local authority. Um, so we, as a result of that, we have put some actions into our education plan, which is on the agenda later today, which is about strengthening that inclusive practice within our secondary schools. So that's the purpose of it. It is a lot of work and we, we do it when there's a real clear uh, purpose and focus for that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we'll have a third question from Bailey Hearn and then from Councillor Allen and I'll move the report. So Bailey Hearn, please. Thank you very much. Um, a third question is um, based on the uh, suicide prevention on page 40, a uh, subject close to my heart. Um, and it's also referenced in uh, paper eight that we'll be speaking about later on. Uh, I'm interested in how the suicide prevention strategy is going to work. And is there a specific suicide intervention as suicide prevention and suicide intervention are completely different? And how will that work with families as we must respect the rights of young people, especially where it may be family issues that are a cause for um, suicide um, thoughts in a young person and how that will be dealt with um, properly, properly, I suppose, and um, with cognizance of the fact that the families, uh, whether they're involved or not. Uh, thanks very much, Bailey here, and that's uh, another very pertinent question, may I say. Um, we did hear a little bit about the work that's ongoing at last committee, but I don't know if you can would like to answer that, Susie, please. Yes, um, this this remains a significant area of work, and we continue to work on the guidance um, 
with schools and training and are very mindful of the role of families. And you'll be aware of our links with Lighthouse and they um, very much work alongside of parents because you're quite right. It is very important um, to ensure that work um, is focused on all of the the complex factors that can lead to these situations. When it comes to suicide interventions, um, we seek to understand the, the reasons behind this, but it is very much um, the case that we need a partnership approach to interventions and we work closely with health on these um, matters. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Yeah, it's just a supplementary as, as somebody that's um, had training in suicide intervention. Um, it can be stressful for members of staff um, and it's just how that is then taken forward because the members of staff may not have the time to continue that intervention and it needs to be passed on. Um, so it's just how that will work and the framework that's in place for that. Yeah, the framework is very much designed to make sure that it isn't education staff that are leading on the suicide interventions. Um, and we um, have a staged approach to, to manage um, levels of risk. And that is very much based on having the right partners around our education professionals. Thanks, Susie. Thank uh, thanks, Bailey Hernand. I do think this will be a an ongoing discussion that we have, so I appreciate the question. Councillor Allen, please. Thank you, convener. Um, this morning I happened to have a meeting with uh, the local constable in Octorarda, and whilst I was meeting with her, she was invited to the local school to deal with an antisocial incident. Now, before she went, she actually told me it wasn't really a big problem in the local school, which was very refreshing because you get an awful lot of anecdotal comments from parents and the community to say that it is a big problem. On page 33 of the report, it talks about a new strategy, an exclusion strategy for Perth and Kinross that was introduced last August. I just wonder how we're getting on with our approaches to bullying and how widespread it is. Is that something that can be shared? Thank you. Fiona Mackay, maybe please. Um, I suppose we have two uh, approaches around uh, the, the question there. So we did introduce our, our exclusion guidance last year um, and that is uh, an, an approach to working with our schools to support children to be in school as much as absolutely possible um, and only a, where there is a last resort will we um, have a, a school will exclude a young person, um, but it can happen as we are aware. Um, well, the other work that we have been undertaking has been around our anti-bullying approach. Um, the current Perth and Ross anti-bullying strategy has been in place for a number of years and we recognise that there are uh, developments nationally uh, that have meant that we need to, we're at a point where we need to be reviewing that. So we have worked with Brian Donnelly, who's an external consultant over the last year, um, to uh, work with our schools and it's the whole community within our schools. So it's our children, our young people, their parents um, and the staff and, and management within schools to look at what's required in terms of supporting um, positive relationships as well as um, reducing incidents of bullying. So we're just at the point of being able to pull that um, information that we've gathered from uh, our communities together uh, to help us inform our, our reviewed strategy which we'll be taking forward later this or taking out uh, for further consultation and then um, approval later this year uh, but yes it's certainly uh, been an, a, a topic that many people have been keen to engage with and it's very much linked to our uh, approaches to improving positive relationships Thank you, Fiona. I think Sheena's going to add to that as well. Please, Sheena. Councillor Allen, if I may, I see a, a connection between your first and, and that question in terms of issues that perhaps are stubbornly difficult um, to improve. They're wicked issues. Uh, there is, again, no silver bullet here, you know, in terms of approaches. However, we also need to remember that young people spend 11% of their time over the course of a year in school. And so key to any approach that we take is, as Susie mentioned, in the context of suicide prevention, 
is that we do that in partnership with others. <clears throat> and another key area of influence, of course, are peers and those around um, young people. And so any approach to tackling an issue like bullying, you would appreciate is therefore multifaceted. So it's it's absolutely about, you know, setting principles, ground rules, that kind of thing, but exploring your own behaviour, the behaviours of others, how you respond to that and, and what you see and hear in wider society. So it is a very complex issue with no simple solution, but one that we think through the wide consultation that's been undertaken in relation to um, how we best tackle bullying and also support those who are victims of it and help those who are the perpetrators of it to refine and modify their behaviour. So again, even within that, there, there are many different strands to this complex piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Thank you, uh, Sheena, as well. Um, I'm going to move the paper now, if that's OK. Um, I think this paper confirms that we're generally speaking in a pretty good place. And, Perth and Kinross, as far as education is concerned. Indeed, we have been for a, a number of years. Um, but as we also say and have said for a number of years that there's no room for complacency and there are certainly areas that we need to continue to improve on. Um, not least, we need to strengthen our provision for kids with additional support need. And uh, although reduced this year, and it touches upon some of the questions, the violence and aggression towards teachers and other staff, although reduced this year, still far too high. And we need to make sure we work on that. I think the two things are related, actually. I think our continued support for additional support needs and violence and aggression against teachers is related. It's not completely the answer, but I think it is related. And of course, um, I think the majority of our school children go through their school careers without any serious bullying, but for the ones that are, that, it's really distressing and I, I we're aware of that. And again, all these things I believe generally are, are related. So lots to be improved on, but I do think generally speaking, there's also lots of good news there as well. And if, if you, with your indulgence, I think some things in this report worthy of note. 95% um, of young carers living with a young carer certificate, I think is really important. I think 810 Duke of Edinburgh awards, far more than previously, is important because education is not just about literacy and numeracy. It's about the, about the broader sense of education. 89% um, of primary school children and 94% of secondary school children had their um, catchment requests granted, which is testament to Karen Roberts and her team. I think that is impressive and important. 82% uh, of primary one starters and meeting their expected development milestones. And I do wonder whether early years childcare expansion is starting to pay dividends in that regard. 95% of leavers go on to positive destinations, which is ultimately what we're all here for, I believe. And probably most importantly, there are high levels of literacy and numeracy recorded when we measure it in P1, P4 and P7. So uh, no complacency, absolutely not, but also lots to be proud of. And I think we, we owe our thanks for everything that I've just said there to everyone who's involved and works in our schools, frankly. So thank you. Um, and I'm happy to move this report. Any comments, please? Uh, Councillor Barrett, please. Thank you, convener. I'd just like to add my thanks to this, all the staff and teams across ECS and their partners for the work underlying the, this performance report, which covers a time of continuing change and challenge as we recover from the impacts of COVID. As Councillor Shires and the convener has said, there is lots of good stuff in here, including I'd like to highlight our personalised support for care experienced young people and rolling out and achieving best practice and consistent approaches to close the attainment gap and our support for the 34% of our young people who have additional support needs. Helping them helps their peers, it helps their teachers and it helps their families and it can just make a huge difference right across. So I'd just like to say thank you to everyone involved. Well said, Councillor Barrett. Uh, Councillor Leeson, please. Thank you, convener. I actually, in my chat, I'm uh, I'm happy to let Councillor Shires go as she's ahead of me in the chat.
Go for it, Brian. Okay, thank you very much, convener. Yes, um, I would um, firstly like to echo the words from Executive Director Devlin in her introduction. In my time as a councillor, the commitment, creativity, perseverance, uh, resilience and service shown by teams across ECS is evident for all to see. And I'd like to record my thanks to all our staff also. In the chambers, we uh, we sit and ask many questions and sometimes make demands, but they are the people in the front line who are really making a difference for people and their outcomes across our region. Um, doing a bit of research in 2006, um, the Getting It Right for Every Child implementation plan was published as our approach of working together with families to enable a rights respecting, strengths based, inclusive approach that understands well-being as being about all areas of life, including family, community and society, valuing difference and ensuring everyone is treated fairly, considering and addressing inequalities. And those aims are all things that absolutely no one can disagree with. And since uh, being adopted, um, getting it right for every child has been updated and refreshed. And rightly so, we absolutely need a pragmatic approach to changing circumstances and people's needs. Um, but to be honest, we're long past the time for, for uplifting statements in relation to eradicating poverty. The poverty and so societal inequalities we have across the country between the most advantaged and disadvantaged families are incontrovertible, really. And I would like to add my appreciation to our teaching staff for the attainment results our region have produced. The results are testament absolutely to their dedication and skill in their posts. But the education attainment gap between richest and poorest is endemic of the current wider societal problems that we see. I think it's fair to say that there have been changes in curriculum for excellence that have contributed to some of the education attainment problems we see now. Speaking with secondary teachers, one criticism is all standard grade qualifications were taught over two years. Curriculum for Excellence got rid of that and now teachers have to pretty much cram in the same what they did in two years into one. And of course that means fourth year then becomes incredibly tough. Increased pressure for teachers as well as students. The older 2-2-2 two, two and two model of clustering year groups definitely had its benefits as opposed to the current 3-3 three and three from Curriculum of Excellence. The idea was that children would do an extra broad year of education in S3, but it really doesn't work that way as children pick their subjects in second year and then drop subjects. They then drop subjects again at the end of S3. So this impacts on subject numbers and means there are children who won't get as broad an education up to the age of 16, contrary to one of the core aims. And from my recollection of being in school, sitting in classrooms isn't for everyone. It wasn't for everyone when I went to school in the 90s, and it certainly won't be the case for many children now. And ultimately, we need a fundamental change, really, in desk-bound education for some children. From an academic point of view, simply getting kids into the building and somehow thinking they'll do work when they have little interest in the subject or just plain refuse to do it is shown to be unsuccessful. So... I think overall, nationally, the Cabinet Secretary really has a big job in her hands. She said that she's determined in producing a cohesive package of reform, and she promised teachers that she would try and heal the relationship between the government and teaching staff, who, as we know, have had spells in the picket lines in the winter and spring. But the truth is, our education system needs a radical shake-up, not just reforms that just really tinker around about the edges. And teachers are already upset and dismayed at delays to abolish the SQA and change their examination system of assessment. So things, it, things, things can be better, absolutely, but we absolutely dramatically need a change because on a national level, the poverty-related attainment gap is still persistent and children from the most deprived and disadvantaged backgrounds and those with additional support needs are still suffering. Uh, so for me, there's there's no celebration really in the national attainment gap going back to 2019 pre-pandemic levels because the 2019 gap showed that the system wasn't equal then and it negatively impacted children from the most deprived areas. And that ultimately, the inequalities that are barriers to life chances won't respect time. Thank you, Councillor Leesman. Uh, I, I certainly agree that vocational, broader education, if you like, is really important and getting it right for every child is a difficult high bar. It's a difficult aspiration, but nonetheless, it's a worthy one. So thank you. Councillor Shires, please. Thank you, convener. It's always a hard act following Councillor Leishman. Um, just um, in, in, 
a brief a summary of my our views on on this paper is it just shows the breadth of the service that you know a, a diminishing amount of people have to deliver um, on behalf of children young people and families across Paris thinking Ross um, I'm, I'm always interested in, in how the papers are presented and the narrative and then the kind of the numbers that sit in behind it and I think it is really you kind of often you just get engrossed in reading the narrative and then you get to the numbers which actually show the picture um, and I think um, in, the, in the time I've been a councillor I've definitely noticed how how much the, the drilling down into that data has made such a difference in, in allowing us to target increasingly um, uh, smaller uh, budgets onto onto the areas that make a real difference, particularly, and I know you highlighted it, convener, things like the, the increase in the number of people doing Duke of Edinburgh. It's that stuff that helps create the young people that go out with a bit, their heads held high and, and the confidence to then go on to whatever comes after their school experience. And, and I think that's something that we should really celebrate. Um, and I really hope that um, I don't know how these papers then get translated out to the wider public, but I think a lot of people out in Perth thinking Rose would be quite encouraged if they actually read um, the, the highlight summaries uh, in this document and could see that actually the, the stuff that's been delivered day in, day out by our teachers, our school staff, our social workers, our early years practitioners and, and the full gamut of people across education and chosen services and how much it's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shires. I was trying not to be t too personal and mention the the um, schools football cup that we had this year, but it was another great example of education in its broader sense. We had four cup finals, I think, were attended by over a thousand parents and children, and it was a night that the players who played in it on four occasions will will not forget. So um, you're absolutely right. Anyway. Uh, um, with that little bit of uh, self-indulgence there appreciated, can we agree the paper? Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to move to, or I'm going to ask Councillor Frampton to move to paper seven, which is the carer's strategy. But let me just say at this point that I really appreciate the work that Councillor Frampton's done in the children's services bit of education, children's services. So thank you, Councillor Frampton. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Hazel to speak to the paper, please. I mean, the, this is the carer strategy, which um, is, is a joint venture with our partners in um, Perth and Perth uh, PCAVs and our NHS partners to um, deliver our services to young people who are providing care with the primary objective of young people being young people first and having a caring role as a secondary part of their lives. Um, clearly, there there are a number of issues that um, need to be supported for young people um, across Perth and Kinross, and you know we need that to be delivered in a variety of ways in order to make that effective. Um, the strategy that you have in front of you is the updated strategy from the, the 2019 to 22 strategy that we've currently been working to. So this is accompanied by a delivery plan um, and we particularly ask you to look at um, outcome seven, which um, is on page 114 to 117 of your papers, um, which detail the actions that will be taken forward in respect of, of young people who are carers and just how we want to deliver their care. Thank you, Hazel. Um, any questions? Councillor Shires. Thank you, Vice Convener. The first of my questions um, is around on page eight, where it refers to the support for young parent, young carers um, to encourage them to consistently attend school. Um, do we know if this has become I'm presuming the answer to this is yes, it has become, but um, do we know if it has become more of a challenge post COVID um, and, you know, how do we compare to, to other local authorities? Hazel, can you answer that, please? Sorry. 
I was just saying that it, it has been a challenge um, throughout COVID, just actually seeing young people, um, our, our key partners who are the deliverers of the majority of care at Perth and Cross Voluntary Action, um, who do actually provide a, a number of the practical resources for for children and young people weren't able to meet with these young people. There, there were a number of uh, groups that couldn't take place because of COVID. So um, there's been a period of, um, I suppose, a reintroduction of a number of support services. We have um, a high number of young people now identified um, across our schools in Perth and Kinross. We have um, uh, young people who are carers champions within 60 of our schools um, who are a contact person within each school to ensure that young carers needs are represented. There's individual support continuing um, drop in sessions that will that um, go ahead regularly and a young carers voice group. So we are hearing the voice of young people and what it is that matters to them. What are the things that make a difference? Um, you'll see from the report that we also have um, specific tutoring for young carers so that that can happen out with school and out with a young person's home environment where that might be challenging because of their caring responsibilities. Um, and that's 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 just been enhanced year on year. And we now have 109, I think it is, um, check that number, but um, who are accessing that support and who are really benefiting from the additional support that can be provided by the teacher who is specifically employed to support young carers. Thank you, Hazel. Councillor Shires, do you have another question? Um, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, my question is broadly over carers themselves. How do we identify, measure and recognise hidden carers? Thank you. Is Ellie able to answer that? I, I do keep pressing the button, but it's not going on. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do um, have an issue about identifying hidden carers and, you know, that's why we're trying a number of different um, opportunities to to help young people identify themselves. Thus, the reason for the champions within schools, um, a very high profile provision across Perth and Canross. I think it would be um, quite difficult to go unnoticed, um, but clearly that won't reach everyone who is a hidden carer. Um, we rely on other professionals to ensure that they are um, profiling the needs of the people they come into contact with, not just those working with children, but those who are working with adults who have disabilities um, and if there are children in the household. So there are a number of different ways we try and identify young people who are carers um, and also parent carers, which had been a neglected group and we have um, in the last year in particular been looking specifically at how can we best support parent carers also um, as a as a group of people who who have a number of needs. Thanks Hazel. Councillor Shires. Thank you. Um, throughout the report the the prevalence and importance of partnership working comes through, um, working with PCAVs in particular and Bernardo's and other agencies. Um, given the budget challenges that we uh, that we and um, the third sector face and the fact that many of these organisations don't get multi-year budgets, um, is there more that we can do to assess if multi-year budgeting would support um, better delivery and allow for planning um, for for support for carers um, and allow and therefore allow interventions um, to be planned, which would make more of a difference. Hazel. Again, uh, uh, President Council Shires, there's there's no indication uh, that any funding will be diminished. Um, Obviously, there's always growing need, and um, you know any additional resources are always welcome. Um, certainly, you know these are these are 
challenging times for everyone and everything needs to be considered in that in that frame. Um, but certainly, you know, there, there is a real priority to support young people who are carers and, and, and that's not that's not, um, you know, dwindling in any way. You know, that's something that remains very alive for for us all. Thank you, Hazel. There are no more questions, so I'll just go to. The vision in Perth and Kinross is for young carers to achieve their potential despite the responsibilities linked with their caring roles. To make sure we can make this vision a reality, a range of supports have been established which are designed to meet their individual needs. The support services available to young carers have evolved during the lifetime of the previous carer strategy 2019 to 2022. The increased range of flexible supports available to young carers in Perth and Kinross is directly linked to the robust partnerships we have with Perth and Kinross Association of Voluntary Services, Young Carers Centre, Perth Autism Services, Bernardo's, Aberlour and many other third sector providers who have come together to help identify need and develop creative supports that will be available when needed. The content of the Refreshed Carers, Young Carer Strategy 2023-26 demonstrates the commitment to working closely with partners to achieve the outcomes identified. This collaboration will continue to be very important to enable appropriate responses to the changing needs of young carers. I would also like to add that I recently attended the Young Carers Festival 2023, where I had the opportunity to speak to many young carers from, carers from different areas of Scotland. Coming away from the festival, I believe firmly that all who work towards supporting our young carers in Perth and Kinross should be commended for their commitment and efforts to keep services operational for all our young carers who also do an outstanding job in their caring roles. I'm happy to move this report. Apologies, Councillor Frampton. Yes, I do need to second that. You're absolutely right. I firmly second. Any comments? Um, Councillor Leishman. Thanks very much, Vice Convener Frampton. Um, research on the topic was very, very interesting. Um, I found that we have estimated 900,000 carers in Scotland, of which 328,000 unpaid carers are concerned for their physical and mental health, and 195,000 are worried about their ability to cope financially. And looking into the paper, I found that there is more care being provided by unpaid carers now than ever before and that one in five of Scotland's adults now support a relative, a close friend or neighbour because of chronic illness, taking in conditions such as mental health issues, dementia, disability or old age. And as elected members, we all know that Perth and Kinross is already a low paid economy. We have a widening gender pay gap and wages have not kept pace with inflation. Carers with lower household incomes are more likely to be providing significant amounts of care which is classes over 20 hours a week. And by having to spend more of their time providing care, their ability to cope financially is seriously impacted, driving many of these carers into hardship and poverty at the same time that many are sacrificing their own health and well-being for loved ones. Also, the Scottish Government recognised that there are 30,000 young carers in Scotland with just over 5,000 being recorded as being in school. Research from the Carers Trust and Young Carers Services show that one in five children in a class is caring responsibilities. And we need to be mindful that many young carers aren't open about their situation within the school setting. There could be fear of social work intervention at the circumstances or bullying from their peers or the stigma that may be attached to their home life circumstances. That's backed up by statistics such as 52% of young carers surveyed by Carers Trust Scotland said they always or usually feel stressed because of being a young carer and 49% said that they never or do not often get help in school, college or university to balance their caring and education work, with a third saying that they usually or always struggle with the education slash caring balance and that there is not often or never someone at their school, college or university who understands about them being a carer. 
It's absolutely essential that carers get the support they need to recover and to stay well and meet the rising cost of living. That working carers are held to stay in employment and that all carers can feel visible, valued and supported. That was a quote from Richard Mead, the director of Carers Scotland, and I'm sure all of us as elected members in Perth and Kinross can agree with it. Thanks very much, Vice Convener. Thank you. Councillor Shires. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I agree with a lot of what uh, Councillor Leishman has just said. What I would say, though, is that now, compared to you know when I first started out as a councillor, and I think Sheena will probably um, support this, we didn't talk about young carers in the way that we, we do now. They were very much, um, much more in that hidden category. And whilst it, you know, it's still a real challenge to us, the fact that we do talk about them, that we do recognise their responsibilities and the challenges that they face, that you don't go into a single school without them being um, discussed as a, as a key group of, of importance for um, resource being put their way. Um, the work of being done at um, PCAVs with the EZC um, education support for young carers, all of that has only happened over the last 15 years or so, and it is a, a journey that I very much hope that, that we can continue. Um, my comment that I made, or the question that I asked rather, about um, funding support, whilst I recognise there isn't a diminishing of the budget, there's more pressure on it um, and that's not going to reduce. And I think any opportunities we have to, to bang the drums, not the right expression, but to, to fly the flag for our, our young and older carers and make sure that that funding isn't reduced in any way and is in fact added to um, so that we can deliver on our responsibilities and commitments to this key group. Um, I think it is something we should seek to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shires. I can completely concur with what you just said there. I hand back to convener. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Frampton. We're content to agree that last report. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Frampton. Much appreciated. We'll, we'll just move straight on to paper number eight, uh, which is the Perth and Kinross Education Improvement Plan, and I'll ask Sheena to introduce it, please. Thank you, convener. Um, I am pleased to introduce the Annual Education Service Improvement Plan. It is required to be submitted to the Scottish Government by the 30th of September this year, and it must also contain an update on progress against the national priorities set for 22-23 and outline the actions that we will take during this coming academic session, August 23 to June 24. Collaboration with stakeholders and a consideration of our local context, two things that you've heard us speak about already today, <clears throat> are both required when identifying the, the improvement out, uh, priorities. And this collaboration has been undertaken in a variety of ways, including, but not um, exhaustively, discussion with uh, teachers during developmental sessions, um, co collation of all early learning and child care and school improvement plans that have been submitted in June, and also collaboration with partners on actions which relate to mental health, to tackling poverty and indeed to child protection. Last year's plan saw the introduction of what we call national stretch aims, and this year there's a new requirement to develop those stretch aims in core areas of performance rather than on a yearly basis, which would make them really targets, but over a three year period so that we can actually identify challenging stretch aims. Annual reporting, however, on progress towards meeting those will take place each year. Key achievements against our commitments from last year's plan include improvements in both literacy and numeracy targets across all sectors, and I mentioned that earlier. Some improvements in those outcomes for our care experienced school leavers and a slight reduction in the gap between the most and least deprived children and young people by the time they reach S3. The Early Learning and Childcare West Bank outdoor project is now established and you have, if you haven't been able to take the opportunity of a visit there, although I know many of you have, can um, highly recommend that. There was a very comprehensive summer programme of activities, um, food and fun, which was well attended also by children and families. Good collaboration with children and young people has seen the development of a participation strategy for our young people and the introduction of young people as inclusion ambassadors in four schools has been the start of a full programme of such for Perth and Kinross. 
All secondary schools and 70% of uh, primary schools now have a young carer champion, an increase from previous years. As we've heard discussed already today in this chamber, the poverty gap remains, as do gaps in attainment between boys and girls and within other key priority groups. The rise in the numbers and complexity of those with additional support needs requires all those working in education and partners to review how we can address any barriers to learning. Attendance figures continue to be lower than pre-pandemic and relationships and behaviour continue to be a focus for all who work in our schools, locally and nationally, and all other partners who support our children, young people and families. The Education Plan has identified the priorities and actions that aim to address these areas and will drive the work of all of our early learning and childcare in schools for the coming session. There are a range of officers convener who will um, take any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Bailey Hearn, please. Thank you very much. Um, my first question is based on uh, the children, young people with additional support needs on page 159 and the statistics in the first paragraph about the numbers of children in Perth and Kinross per thousand pupils. Um, something I keep mentioning in, is uh, that in there, there's uh, children and young people with autism. 21 to 29 children per 1,000. Um, what about those that are on the autistic spectrum disorder, which is not necessarily autism? Um, and I hope they're not included under the mental health concerns because children with mental health concerns are, are different. There are different mental health concerns compared to those with additional support needs. So if the autism isn't catching the rest of those on the autistic spectrum disorder, where are those figures? Um, and how are the more complex young people with comorbid disorders and conditions recorded? Uh, Fiona Mackay, maybe, please. Uh, that, that is a, a very technical question. I think um, that I would need to go away and have a look and speak with my uh, MIS colleagues around uh, what is, is included in each of the categories. Um, but I'm happy to to do that and ensure that um, we are being consistent in terms of collecting the data on all of our children with additional support needs um, as we go. There are difficulties um, where there is comorbidity, um, but what I would say is that um, all of the additional support needs of children are collected. So sometimes the, the numbers um, in terms of when we look at the actual level, uh, needs that are recorded against children are greater than the number of children. That's because we, we do gather um, information where there may be two or three things that sit uh, for one child as their additional support needs. So um, I'd like just to be to reassure people that, that all of the information is collected, but there, there will be um, some decisions that require to be made around what is the, present, the greatest presenting factor. Thanks, Fiona. Sharon, I think you want to add something, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, Fiona is, is quite right, Bailey Ahern, that it's a complicated picture, but in terms of what we report in, in this um, in this paper, the reports of children with additional support needs come from our CMIS recording. It's our MIS system. Um, there's a limited amount of um, categorisation within that. And so where you've got children who have a diagnosis of ASD, that is the diagnosis and that's what we record in CMIS. On top of that, though, there are a number of other um, questions that are then recorded within CMIS. So apart from the, the additional support needs that's recorded, the factors arising from that and the, the support that's required for that additional support need is also contained within that information. So as Fiona um, Mackay rightly said, there is some um, crossover between a diagnosis and the number of needs and some children with autism may also have a mental health need and they will have a number of other additional factors that makes the recording of it and the, the explanation of it fairly complex but as Fiona um, said in terms of reassurance that that is just a recording issue what happens on the ground in practice would happen at the child's planning stage and that would absolutely be done in conjunction with our partners within health Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Just as a follow up on that, I mean, it's a question I bring up all the time that not just in Perth and Kinross, but as a, as a country and as a nation, we keep mentioning autism and autism strategies where they actually mean 
autistic spectrum disorders and we need to get that language right if we're going to be inclusive the whole point is we're going to be inclusive and helping those with additional support needs and to get that right you need to get the title right and it's not not a um a complaint against the the pkc as a, as a whole it's nationally we need to get that right i think that's a very valid point uh, bailey Hearn. thanks for raising it um i'll go to councillor mcpherson for a question and then assuming that he's the only other questioner bailey Hearn, you can maybe ask questions two or three together after that and then i'll move to the report uh, councillor mcpherson please uh, thank you, convener. It was just really for some further information um, on page 162 under the parental involvement, engagement and family learning. It states that um, um, a total of 630 applications for parental receipt, uh, parental support were received. It was just to um, um, ask what, what are the sort of facets and, and, and uh, uh, extent of that? Basically, what is um, parenting support? Sharon, please, thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, Councillor McPherson, um, we have a parenting and family learning team and Rona Cameron, who's the team leader, is, is here um, to answer any more detailed questions. Uh, but in terms of parenting and family support, we've got a statutory requirement to make sure that we have a parental involvement and engagement strategy. And that is, in fact, the next paper um, on this, uh, the committee. But we also provide a range of different parenting programmes and ranges of support to all sorts of parents from birth onwards. And our parenting and family learning team provide that in lots of different ways. Some of that's through the summer programme that we heard about, some of it's through formal programmes, and some of which are mentioned here, such as PEEP, learning together, um, uh, all sorts of, of different um, approaches. And we've increased those over this year. Um, and we've also increased the numbers of, of practitioners involved in that team so that we can provide support for older um, children as well and parents of teenagers. So it's really a, a, a very comprehensive programme that is provided by our parenting and family learning team. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you can be patient a little while longer, Bailey Hearn, we'll have a question from Councillor Al and then Councillor Barrett, please, and I'll come to you lastly, if that's OK with you. Thank you. Thank Councilor. you, convener. Uh, my questions relate over uh, national priorities, improvement and attainment, particularly in literacy and numeracy over pages 23 and 24. And one of the intended outcomes is that children and young people will benefit from their parents and carers being involved in the life and work of their school. I'm not quite understanding how that's going to work, the planned action. Um, can can we, we maybe get some more elaboration on that, please? Sharon, again, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Allen. It's it's well recognised that parents are the primary educators of their, their children, and that is really the, the reason behind the parental involvement and engagement strategy that we're sharing uh, later on this afternoon. So it's imperative that we involve and engage our parents in their understanding of their children's learning at the earliest stage. We do that quite successfully in early years and it becomes more challenging as children and teenagers grow, as I'm sure many parents here will testify to. But there's a, a, a real focus for schools in trying to make sure that we can engage parents to help understand their children's learning environments, to share in that um, and to become involved in the life and work of the school. So we have parent councils, obviously, as a part of that formal process, but there are many different ways that we would want to engage parents within the life and work of the school. And we actively encourage, and schools I know are, are always looking for different and creative ways to encourage parents to look at their school improvement plans, to pay attention to what the schools are trying to focus on, and also to support the schools in lots of other ways that we've talked about. So it's something that we continue to work through and the paper around the parental involvement and engagement strategy that we are going to talk about next gives much more detail about the ways in which we are supporting our schools and our parents to work together um, to enhance children's learning. Councillor Al. Thank you for that answer. What I'm trying to get to here is under the planned action, we're talking about creating a self-evaluation tool to support planning for parent engagement, including 
case studies of highly effective practice. I realise that this is mission impossible, so I'm not trying to be awkward here. I realise this is a highly, highly difficult situation that we face with in trying to get parents and carers involved. I just don't see that a self-evaluation tool is the answer to that. Maybe you did answer me properly and I've missed it, but I'm just not getting it. Thank you. Um, Sheila, do you want to add something? Thank you. It might be helpful to, to give you just a few more sort of practical examples of what we're talking about. And when we go out into schools, Councillor Allen, or when inspectors go out into schools, there are questionnaires that are provided for parents and carers. And one of those questions is how involved do you feel in the life and work of the school? And there's judgments made about that. So schools are expected to evaluate, self-evaluate how well they think they do in terms of engaging um, parents and carers in the life and work of the school. That will look very different, as Sharon has said, at different ages and stages. And um, what we certainly found during the, the, period, the extended periods of lockdown was that parental engagement actually increased significantly in a number of areas. And we saw a benefit to that through young people's engagement with their learning. It wasn't universal and across the board because working parents had challenges themselves in being able to do that, but we certainly did see. So we know from evidence that where parents understand what at a very simple level, for example, the kind of um, topics that children might be studying that year, then they can support additionally by asking questions, going places if that's possible, that, that kind of activity. Now we can't make a judgment about how well or how frequently parents do that, but we can make a judgment about the impact that that kind of involvement has in learning. And so the, we do want to evaluate that, but not to the being judgmental in terms of parents. So I hope that reassures you that this isn't about us trying to evaluate parental performance, but rather the impact of positive engagement of parents in the, the life and work of the school, because we do find that that actually helps young people in terms of their engagement. For example, if parents understand what the anti-bullying anti approaches are in a school and can reinforce and support that, that has a significantly positive impact, not just on their children, but on other children in the school as well. So I hope that's going some way further to maybe answering your question. Thank you. It's much clearer now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sharon. Councillor Barrett, please. Thank you, convener. Um, just going back to questions about additional support needs um, reminded me that I was at the Mental Health and Wellbeing Festival in Perth Concert Hall at the weekend and at the CAMS, no, sorry, acronym, I, I looked this up, at the Child Adolescent Mental Health Services stall, um, they were saying that they've been working on identifying, you know, there's a huge backlog of referrals for CAMS. They've been working on identifying the key um, patterns that are coming up among the referrals and producing um, materials with strategies to address those topics. And this is helping to bring down the referral backlog, which is great. And I just wondered if ECS were aware of this and able to access those, either to use them or to pass them on to schools as an additional support to teachers. Thank you. Could I just say before Susie comes in that, that triage approach where um, that there can be a frustration at, from the time of perhaps a need manifesting itself to a referral to then being seen. That triage approach is one that's been undertaken in speech and language therapy as well and proven to actually then have such an impact in some occasions that a referral has not then had to go all the way through. And so I know that from um, Diane Caldwell in the CAMS team, that was an approach that she was seeking to replicate which is to help those parents understand how they can best help their own young people that might then result in not needing that external kind of support. But Susie would be able to give you a wee bit more information than I am, Councillor Barrett. Thanks. Thanks, Gina. Susie, please. Yes, thank you. Um, 
we do liaise with our CAMS colleagues and work with them. And I think one practical example that I can give of that is around their rolling out of a programme called Decider Skills, which has been targeted both at practitioner staff and at parents. Um, and we have been working with them to identify two schools that will go forward as pilot for whole staff training. And that's very much taking the principles of cognitive behaviour therapy and working with staff as to how to apply some of those strategies. So I think that's one example of where we're able to work collectively to do more early intervention and prevention. Uh, we do also meet with them strategically and I think it would be helpful uh, to look further at some of the data that's coming through that you mentioned, Councillor Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Bailey Hearn, would you like to ask your last two questions and then I will move the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my first of those questions is on the last paragraph on page 159 and it's a bit of clarity over what the paragraph is, means. Is it said there about the increasing levels and complexity of the need outlined above is driving a review of policy processes and resources, partnerships and built environment that will form the additional support needs transformation program to be completed over the next five years. Is that five years to produce the programme or is that five years to introduce the transform transformation of an agreed programme already? And is that, if it is the latter, do you think it's going to take five years to, to introduce that sort of transformation programme? Sharon, please. Thank you, Bailey O'Hearn. Uh, the growing level of, and complexity of need across additional support needs uh, within education is, is well known. It's a national issue um, and we've been working, as you know, through the education plan over the last three years um, to, to highlight and focus additional support needs as a key area of focus across all of our areas of education from that very early stages um, of early years right the way through to, to leavers. We're in, we have actually um, produced a, a scope for an ESN transformation programme that will require um, partnership across all areas and including the school estate. So um, members might be um, reminded of the early years transformation programme where we were looking to make sure that the environments that we were building as part of the 1140, for example, were able to um, produce the environments that could support children with quite complex levels of need because you can't transport three year olds to a specialist provision and make it a good experience for them. So that programme we are looking at over five years and there will be some things in terms of the, the school estate and the changes that need to be made may take over five years. But the actions are happening now and they're in this plan and they will continue over the next five years um, and it will go from the early stages of early intervention and prevention um, and addressing barriers to additional support needs right up into the complexity of supporting children who are on the edge of not actually managing to maintain a mainstream placement and going into perhaps off-site provision or independent school provision. So it's a large complex programme. It will take probably longer than five years, but our programme certainly spans a five year plan of action to take us forward um, in this really challenging area. Thank you for that largely reassuring answer, I think anyway. Yes, thank you. I was reassured and certainly reassured when I seen the new additional support needs provision at the new Riverside School. And you can see that that transformation is working. And if we can replicate that right across the education estate, then we're doing very well. Agreed. I think that was two questions wrapped into one, was it? No, I've got another question. Go for it, Bailey Hen, please. Uh, the last question is on the inclusion ambassadors that are mentioned on page 166. Uh, I mean, I'm interested how these inclusion ambassadors are going to work with young people that struggle with inclusion um, and struggle with regular attendance in school um, and how we're going to, how those inclusion ambassadors are going to work with those that probably have the most complex uh, issues which um, bar them from inclusion. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon. Um, Fiona McKay, maybe actually, please, Fiona. 
Um, yes, so our inclusion ambassadors are at an early stage in terms of forming. Uh, the, it's building on a national programme that has been around for um, around three years now, where um, we've got some uh, young people from all of the local authorities in Perth and Kinross identified who come together to look at how they represent the um, additional support needs um, population uh, of young people and children um, at, in terms of informing strategy and policy service delivery. We're, we're keen and working closely um, with uh, our partners to replicate a similar model at Perth and Kinross because at a local level I think there can be even greater impact from um, uh, the support and engagement of our children and young people in terms of having a voice. Um, so the the intention is not for the young people to work directly with other young people um, necessarily. It is about looking at how they are well represented and ensure that we as a um, as service and as partners that will be working alongside to support them uh, are absolutely understanding of their needs and um, in interests in being involved and uh, informing what, what we do and what policies we create. But there may be other spin-offs from that, and it is very much at an early stage yet. And we are, you know, we are um, keen to work with young people to uh, follow the direction of travel that they might want to take going forward. And that might be around um, how we support and work with them to develop uh, peer support for others. But it isn't the initial um, focus of that programme. Thank you very much. Peer, peer support is important, especially for those that struggle to, to come into school and the best people to get them back into school are their peers. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey Hen. Um, I'm now going to move the report. Uh, there's a lot going on in Sc Scottish education over the next few years. Um, most of it, I believe, is to be welcomed and I think we need to be bold and brave in its implementation, notwithstanding ongoing discussion. But it will be a lot of work for the profession, not least for teachers, and therefore we need to be mindful of that in its implementation. And therefore, in the meantime, we need to keep our eye on the ball. And I believe this education improvement plan will enable us to do that. The plan focuses on tackling inequality, which is important, and there's a greater focus nationally on supporting additional support need and implementing the promise, which is also crucial. And I do believe, as our executive director alluded to, that stretch aims over a three year period is sensible and important because if it's less than three years, it's not really a stretch aim. So that there are many good things in this report, but in the interest of time, I'm delighted to formally move it and I will now ask for comments, please. Uh, Billy Hearn, please. Thank you very much. It is indeed a good report and certainly on the programmes and um, the way we're moving forward with additional support is, is really heartening. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to be able to sit here in three or four years time and, and really congratulate the council on the way they've moved forward and looked at additional support. I just wanted to pick up one point and uh, is the, the West Bank Outdoor Learning Project. Um, it's brilliant. Councillor Shires and I visited it um, last month and the opportunity it will give children and young people from poorer areas of Perth City to experience, experience nature in its raw form that those in the rural schools take for granted. Um, and I really hope to see the success of how outdoor learning works, um, especially for the, the, the disadvantage within Perth City. So an excellent project and really be interesting to see in a year or so's time as to just how successful that's been. Again, Bailey Hearn, completely agree with you. I'm very lucky to be in walkable distance of West Bank, actually, and have been down a number of times. It's genuinely serene, actually. You do feel, even though it's pretty urban, you do you do feel at one with nature. I'm trying not to say, because that sounds very cliched, but I can't think of anything better. But it is a, a really wonderful learning experience, I think, particularly for um, primary school kids who, who are used to an urban environment. So, uh, well said again. Uh, comment from you, please, Councillor Leishman. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, thanks again to Executive Director Devlin for her report. A few weeks ago, 
Uh, at the start of July, I think it was, I visited HMP Perth and met with the governor. And Governor Hodge was good enough to spend a couple of hours with me and I heard about the education, what that goes on in the prison, which was both enlightening and encouraging and absolutely crucial because education reduces reoffending rates and is a vital part of the rehabilitation process. Having a prison resident acquire new skills and turn their own life circumstances around can only improve our society. Uh, it was fascinating hearing what educational opportunities are available to residents in HMP Perth and to be told about many examples and instances that have changed residents and their families' lives for the better. And I think we read one of those examples in the report, um, HMP Perth residents and their children experiencing, I think it's the Family Learning Friday blocks. Um, so yeah, convener, uh, pardon the sudden change of topic, but I'd also like to praise the increase in the uptake of the, the PEF and also how enjoyable I found my and Councillor Massey's visit to West Bank ELC. Um, there are many benefits to encouraging outdoor learning and embracing outside play, especially for the early years sector. And finally, just to finish on, I would like to, to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, and that's uh, the staff reporting of behaviours. I've already praised our teachers in Perth and Kinross for helping to deliver very good results. And this is even more impressive after a pandemic and against increasing inequalities in a society that are making things even harder for children from the most disadvantaged of circumstances and backgrounds to achieve academically. And I know all elected members uh, on this committee and the wider council would have been shocked by the, uh, the severity and the glut of incidents in Fife at the start of the year. And while on picket lines with EIS members in the winter and spring, many teachers told me that they are demoralised by trying to maintain academic standards in the face of pupil on pupil and often pupil on teacher violence. And it's not an exaggeration to say that for many teachers, educating takes a back seat sometimes because they spend so much of their time being distracted by behavioural issues in the classroom. Uh, and Frustratingly, on I think it was on the 24th of May, the Cabinet Secretary announced that there would be an emergency summit on school violence. This was welcomed by the teaching unions, obviously, and quite rightly. But the first scheduled meeting is due to take place on the 5th of September. Three and a half months later, it's just not good enough. And I, I can completely understand teachers feeling let down and deflated. If I didn't feel safe in my workplace and had to keep going back and change and, a, and their benefit and their welfare didn't seem like the primary priority, then I dread going to my work too. Well, oh, thanks for those uh, comments, Councillor Leishman. Uh, it's certainly worth pointing out that this administration here, we've nailed our colours firmly to the mast of support and additional support need and trying to reduce as much as possible the incidence of violence ag and aggression against our teaching staff and indeed our PSAs and our non-teaching staff. Um, it's a hard road, but it's one we're determined to travel. Um, with that, can we agree the report, please? Thank you. We, we, I don't, unless anybody's desperate for a break, we've got one paper to go, so I think we will just go on and do it unless anybody objects to that. So I will ask uh, Sheena to introduce paper nine, which is about parental engagement. The strategy and three-year plan of the Perth and Canoss Parental Involvement Engagement 23-26 provides details of how we as a local authority will meet the duties that are outlined in the Scottish Schools Parental Involvement Act 2006 and how we will support our schools to engage parents meaningfully in the education of their children and in the wider school community. The draft strategy and plan have been created taking into consideration the following. The work that's already been undertaken towards um, achieving the aims of the previous strategy, the Tayside Regional Improvement Collaborative Strategy for Parents, and the biannual Perth and Kinross Parent Survey responses from 2022 to identify any key themes arising, and finally, learning together the National Action Plan for Parental Engagement. The plan and the strategy have been created also in consultation with school leaders and staff. The draft strategy and plan were then shared with key stakeholders, including all Perth and Kinross parent councils. This consultation process highlighted that the majority of parents supported the areas for improvement identified and considered that these relevant to their Perth and Kinross experience. The strategy and plan therefore provides direction for all involved in parental involvement, parental engagement 
and family learning across the Education Authority. And we've heard quite a bit about all of those just in the context of the, the previous papers that we've been um, hearing about today. So we are very pleased to present this and very happy to take any questions convener that the committee may have. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for the last time today, really. Sheila, thank you in terms of introducing the reports. And we've had one or two great questions already about parental engagement, not least from Councillor Allen and Councillor McPherson, but if there are any further questions, we'd be delighted to have them. So first one from Councillor Shires, please. Thank you, convener. I'm going to kind of roll my questions up into one, if that's OK. Absolutely. Um, so it talks about the on page uh, at 4.1 in the report, it talks about the working group and just interested in who was on that, how was it established? Um, and my second part of that question is about uh, schools using online engagement. And I know it has worked really well. Um, I know certainly like our high school parent council, you know, masses of people turned up when previously not masses of people turned up and um, so it's been really positive um, and the opportunity for grandparents and other key family members to be involved I often think these things I, I understand why it's referred to as parental engagement but you know for many families the roles of of other key family members are equally important I think that's a very valid point I think we're, we're using parental engagement in the in the broader sense of the word but noted nonetheless Thank you. Uh, Sheena, please. And then maybe if you can add Rona after Sheena's finished. Thank you. Rona will be able to give you the, the detail in relation to your questions about online and members of working group. I just wish to reassure you about the role of, of grandparents and other important adults in uh, children and young people's lives in their, their wider learning. We also have a grandparents charter that, that we are required as an education authority to give consideration to and, and work um, is underway in relation to that. But actually, parents and carers is probably shorthand for the range of important adults who support children and young people across all of our schools, Councillor Shire. So just to reassure you that we are taking full cognizance of the important roles that they play. Thank you. Rona, please. Thank you. So you're you're right. Um, during COVID, obviously, a lot of the parents' meetings were, were taken online, and actually, it did show a, a huge increase in the the uptake and the attendance for that. And I suppose that was one thing we spoke about within the working group, which um, had representatives sort of from school um, inclusion um, and other sort of um, services across education. Um, what we're looking to do is actually have a a blended model, if you want, of actually some things may be in person, but also understanding for a lot of families online is much easier. And we've certainly found that specifically in some of the rural communities as well. It's much easier for them to, you know, get home from work, for example, go online to attend a, a meeting or a, you know, a, a parent session rather than actually then having to go back out to, to the school as well. So it's mu it is much more efficient for parents. And I think that's why we've seen a, a bigger attendance as well um, at, at those those sessions. Thanks, Rona. Um, thank you, Councillor Shires. Uh, if there's no more questions, I'll very briefly but formally move this report. Um, I do think that parental involvement, important and appropriate adult involvement, to take your point, Councillor Shires, is really important. And I know I was really lucky from a personal experience when my two were at primary school. Uh, my primary school reached out in, in many different ways. It wasn't just a formal parent council, there was many ways they reached out for um, parental in the broader sense of the word engagement that was really successful. Had they not done so, I'm not sure necessarily I would be I would be sitting here today because that's where my passion for education was was lit, I suppose. I'm not always sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that I'm sitting here today, but nonetheless, that was the root of it. And, the, and my point is that that engagement between parents as primary educators and the school is really important. So I'm delighted to formally introduce this report and ask for any comments, please. Thank you, Katrina. Um, just to agree, that's the, the route that many of us have have come through to to you know put ourselves forward for election, having sat on parent council 
uh, bodies, etc. So we should put the shout out to other people that they might like to consider that also. Um, but the, the language around it all, and, and I think increasingly the involvement of grandparents have always had a, a crucial role. But I think whenever we're referring to strategies such as parental you know, strategies, it's just making sure that it is clear that it is that whoever is the significant adults are in, in any child or young person's life is, you know, the, that that is covered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shah, that's a good point. Um, if there are no more comments, then can we agree paper nine? Thank you very much. I think all that uh, is left to be done is for me to, is to thank everybody for coming today. That was a really good meeting, I think. So thanks very much for um, legitimate scrutiny and positive engagement, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.